fault lines are the dynamics of a very seemingly slow-moving process called the uh, evolution of Earth, uh, largely invisible to everyone, um, but they set up tremendous forces that ultimately bring about change, uh, sometimes pleasant change, sometimes shocking change. And um, the leadership development field, which really as a field has been around for at a minimum of about 70 years, if you look at kind of the evolution of the first leadership training programs outside of the military. <clears throat> in the military, it's been around for probably at least a century, but in the world of organizations, companies, not-for-profits, about 60 or 70 years. And uh, the early early training programs are very, we would call them very simplistic today. Um, and um, there weren't too many of them. And really, starting in the 80s and 90s, uh, leadership development became an industry, uh, no longer kind of a nascent field. And so in the hour that I have with you, I'm going to accomplish a couple outcomes. Um, one, I'm going to remind us that it is an industry and that in an industry, certain dynamics occur. Um, there are products, services, uh, there are markets, there are customers, um, <clears throat> there are costs, and uh, there's marketing. It really has become a true industry, and not so distant from something like buying a very expensive automobile. Um, and that has created certain advantages for the field, but it's also created certain fundamental dilemmas, um, which I'm going to highlight throughout most of the talk, which is why is it the leadership development efforts, uh, despite the resources and time commitments, I believe fall seriously short of their potential. I'm going to do that by highlighting what I call five fault lines uh, that have set up leadership development not to realize its potential. And you might call them the fault lines for failure. So that whatever is built on these fault lines ultimately is a shaky structure, which when the earth starts trembling, uh, the structures are not enduring. And as somebody who's been in the field for a long time and deeply concerned about the development of leadership, um, I have a personal interest in making certain that leadership development is enduring, that actually what we develop sticks over the lifespan of an individual. So I will then actually uh, begin to offer up some solutions. Some of these are solutions which um, companies have implemented, but I would argue not well. And so a number of these ideas are ones that your organization might be doing, but not to the level of persistence or institutionalization that I think need to be there in order for leadership development to have a long-term impact beyond an experience. So let me begin with this idea that it is an industry. Uh, those of you who are members of ASTD know you get an annual report or state of the industry. It's about the training industry in general. Um, and you get a sense of how much is being spent and where it's being spent, uh, how it's being delivered. And if you look at this particular cover of the most recent state of the industry report, you'll see uh, the top three content areas managerial and supervisory training. So in that category is leadership development. And you'll see it's number two right behind mandatory and compliance. In other words, it makes up a large portion of the amount of money that's spent in formal training. Uh, there's a study produced by Deloitte, um, which actually is called their Corporate Learning Factbook. And here's a quote from the uh, executive summary in which they talk about the fact that U.S. spending on corporate training grew by 15% last year to over $70 billion in the U.S. and over $130 billion worldwide. And the number one areas of spending are management and leadership. Uh, so in the Deloitte study, actually management and leadership are number one. In the ASTD study, which is a kind of a broader look at training, uh, it's number two on the topic areas. Uh, the Deloitte study also concluded that actually as the millennials who are now of the age where they're taking on more and more managerial roles, um, this is the generation where they're arguing money needs to be spent, training needs to be spent. And this is a generation that may or may not have had much managerial training in themselves. Um, so if we take those two studies, uh, we have a conservative estimate of about 
20 to $30 billion is spent on some form of leadership development training annually across the globe. And that, that's a pretty conservative estimate. In other words, it is an enormous industry. Um, <clears throat> it, this is not uh, a kind of an interesting craft-based field. And whenever you have revenues of this size, it creates a different kind of dynamic, i.e., uh, players who are able to scale, players who are able to produce products and packages that can scale. Uh, you tend to have less customization as the market reaches this, this size, uh, though you do have niche players who will provide customization. Um, but it's a big, big playing field, continues to attract lots of individuals. The production of books on the topic are, is outstanding. Uh, I always am nervous to go and see the the latest uh, production of books on leadership in each year. Uh, the volume has grown tremendously. So let's look at <clears throat> kind of how the dynamics of having an industry as well as how the dynamics of leadership development have been set up in organizations are creating these very important fault lines <clears throat> that are underappreciated in terms of their contribution to the instability or durability of leadership training. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the five that I think are particularly important. And the first, because it is an industry, is what I call the productization of leadership. Um, that as an industry reaches a certain size, there are standardized offerings because the opportunity to grow and grow a business, a leadership development business, are outstanding. There's just a lot of market. And so the easiest way to grow is to scale a product, as you will see. Uh, we, the users of the products, and some of us are producers of those products, um, make important trade-offs in that process, which I'll highlight shortly. The second fault line is what I call the disappearing boss. Um, if you go back to the 1950s and 60s, hard to imagine uh, so far back, but if you look at that era, the boss was actually the primary point for development, hit or miss in terms of its quality, but they were the primary point person for development. Uh, there was no such thing as a 360 feedback tool, so they were your sole source usually of how well you were doing and what you needed to do to improve. Um, and in many ways, the influence of the boss as a development point has been disappearing. The third one is what I call the provider paradox. Um, with an industry come more providers, but providers tend to, over time, specialize and bring unique advantages to their customers. Um, and in a way, it's a bit like uh, Amazon, where you have a lot of choice, but the way you get that choice is being highly differentiated from your competitors. And as you have more and more providers, there's a greater need to differentiate. And some of that comes at the <clears throat> cost of customization, and some of that comes at the cost of uh, getting too fine-grained in terms of the offering. Uh, the fourth dynamic is the splintering of ownership. Uh, because you can now buy leadership training um, at relatively reasonable price points because of the opportunity to buy web-based programs, the opportunity to buy uh, very simple package training programs. Uh, operating units far afield can buy leadership development just for their operating unit. A function can buy leadership training just for their function. Uh, that has created, <clears throat> on the one hand, opportunities for more and more of your organization to have an experience in leadership development, but it's also created some very serious splintering of who owns leadership, which I believe creates this powerful fault line that undermines institutionalization of leadership development in your organization and potentially reinforces the notion that leadership development is cyclical or, in the worst case, a fad. Uh, the final area is make-believe metrics. I'm taking kind of a harsh stand there, but um, uh, I get to see the metrics on which I'm measured as an instructor in leadership development programs, and I get to see the metrics that my clients use to assess their programs. 
And while some of them have some validity, uh, I don't think they answer the more important questions, which would lead senior leaders who are making these investments uh, to believe that this is something that is a long-term commitment and needs to be deeply institutionalized and move beyond, um, say, a project of a CEO or a project of a chief learning officer. So those are the five. We're going to take a bit of a dive into each, see what we think, talk a bit about the consequences of each one, and then I'm going to highlight some solutions that might be implemented to address them. So productization of leadership, well, you always know when you reach that stage when there's a something, something for dummies. And uh, there is, of course, a Leadership for Dummies book out there. Actually, there are a couple of them. <clears throat> I've given you the Australian and New Zealand edition. But if you go and take a look, you'll see you've got a educational leaders for dummies, long, long list. And it's this idea of... Uh, you can take something that's relatively sophisticated and complex and you can turn it into something straightforward and very simple that everybody can get mastery. Uh, that's certainly our wish for leadership and there's a real advantage to simplification in terms of getting the impact you want, but with the productization are some very important trade-offs. And what I have watched and you have watched is a process that kind of takes two forms. The first one I'm showing you here, these are some books, very popular books, uh, all of which have been turned into training packages or presentation packages, learning experiences, and you can literally purchase either individuals who will teach your organization how to be more emotionally intelligent or you can actually uh, invite the author of the book to come and they will do a presentation on their insights from the book. Um, this is, of course, one of the oldest forms of learning in organizations, which is having authorities come and spend some time with the organization. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, I'm often invited to do that, so I'm not a, not a harsh critic of that, but I do think uh, what has happened is that it has created uh, what's the new next hot thing. Uh, and that actually potentially undermines the idea of institutionalizing leadership development and turns it more into a fashion industry. So as the analogy I used earlier, that in some ways there's some parallels, for example, with automobiles. As an industry grows, competitors have to differentiate. Um, you know, if you go and you look on Amazon, you'll see there are more books around very specialized angles of leadership than there would have been 20 years ago. Um, as the authors of 20 years ago took that terrain, they took the kind of universals of leadership, uh, and increasingly as new entrants appear, they have to be highly differentiated. What that means is then they are lacking in certain dimensions of leadership which are important for your managers and leaders to be aware of and actually be developed around. Um, but this is, this is what's hot. So here's what I think uh, uh, the fault line is for this particular very important dynamic in our industry of leadership development, that increasingly the products are out of alignment with the strategic aims of the organization. Uh, potentially, they're also out of alignment with the cultural aims of the organization. And as someone who's done a lot of research in the talent management space, certainly it's clear that one of the ways you get your organization to see deep value in human resources and talent management is to show the direct links between achieving strategic and cultural outcomes and the initiatives you have. Productization uh, is often out of alignment with this. Often there's no direct link made. The second price that's paid is the loss of customization. A little bit later I'll talk about the fact that I do conceive of leadership development as falling into two categories, a set of universal leadership characteristics, but then also a set of unique leadership demands that are specialized to your organization. The product doesn't allow much, if any, customization to your organization. It's, after all, a product. So you're hoping that the fit is close, but the odds are it's not. 
the third dimension is that as these frameworks or books or training packages uh, are created, they tend to be built around what I would call shallow development experiences. So you might have a day on EQ. You might have three days on emotional intelligence. But uh, that's it. Then we're moving on. And so that often creates the fourth dilemma, which is a fad cycle, where each year a new topic is chosen. Um, the signal to the organization is, well, I wonder if last year's EQ, while valuable, <clears throat> is not a top priority now, and maybe I need to focus on digital leadership this year. Uh, again, there's some advantages to that, but I would argue that potentially what it does is it erodes attention to developing at a deeper level the prior experiences. And potentially it could set up cynicism depending on the quality of the training experience. Uh, if they're experienced as packaged with a strong, quote, training emphasis, when the next product arrives, <clears throat> it may generate cynicism about, ah, I guess we have to do this. Um, the other thing is, because of the productization, much of leadership development is delivered by outside vendors, particularly as you go higher in the organization. As a result, senior leaders often now have a mindset that when times get tough, <clears throat> we just cut the spending. Uh, we don't buy any more products for this year. We don't buy any more products for next year. And my fear there is, again, that this erodes the ability to institutionalize your leadership development initiatives. As a result, uh, they become initiatives that are driven by an executive uh, who feels it's important at this moment in time. That executive may or may not be around in four years or five years. And if you look at the few companies that really do a good job at leadership development, it is deeply institutionalized, no matter who the CEO is, no matter who the uh, chief HR officer is, no matter who the uh, chief learning officer is, it is handed off to the next generation. So that's the price <clears throat> we're paying. So what are some thoughts about how we might address that? Well, number one, I think you have to be highly selective. I think we all have to be careful because a bit like a fashion, um, there's a new look each year. And I think we have to think very carefully about how well does that new look, that new approach to leadership, deepen the understanding of our existent, existing leadership competencies. So I've always felt that if you have a competency framework, you have to think and figure out a way to tie the new product emphasis into explaining or deepening your understanding of an existing competency so that individuals see it is this, this new experience is part of something that's more enduring. Um, the next thing is I think it's very important to ensure that the vendor, the provider of this, uh, bring into the experience a deep, deep development emphasis versus simply the transfer of knowledge. Uh, some vendors are very good at this. Uh, some are better at transferring knowledge, and but it ends at the at the knowledge transfer basis. I think the other thing that's very important is you have to commit to embedding this over a multi-year time frame. So if you're serious about emotional intelligence, it is not a one-year program. It's actually part of a multi-year program, um, and you might take different components of EQ uh, each year and explore them in great depth and reinforce them. As well, something we all are familiar with, which is tying these back into uh, performance reviews, tying them back into 360s, which then force you then to also be very selective about your packages because you're having to ask yourself, does this product fit our existing 360? Does it fit our existing performance reviews around leadership dimensions? Um, the final dimension that I wanted to highlight here, final solution, is that I I do think there is a role for productization in the sense that I do believe there are new and important insights into leadership, and there are important trends that are challenging kind of old ways of leading, and those might have to do with digital technology, new generations, the millennials. And so 
I do think you um, there's a place for it, but it has to be complemented with your, I call them your universals. So how do we complement this thoughtfully with our enduring leading leadership competencies? Uh, the next dimension, the disappearing boss. Um, of course, you all know this character from The Office. And uh, in some ways, this is a nice illustration of one of the reasons why the boss has disappeared. Um, there is a lot of cynicism um, about the boss. And if you look at Dilbert, I believe uh, Dilbert is ranked uh, overall 13th uh, for best-selling management books. And if you think about those Dilbert cartoons, they're pretty much all about mocking the boss. So we're in an era where the boss actually doesn't get the, shall we say, all the respect they deserve. Um, and I think there are a couple other things that have changed the focus, or move the focus away from the boss. As leadership development took hold in the 90s particularly, it was accompanied by the rise of the 360 feedback. And again, that from our perspective today, that seems quite normal. But you have to remember going back, as I mentioned earlier, into the 60s and 70s, the only one who gave you feedback on your performance and on your leadership capacity was your boss. Uh, 360 feedback enlarged that pool of individuals. And um, now subordinates had a say, because after all, you were their leader, and followers should have a say about their leader. Peers, more and more of the work that was done was through complex, multifunctional teams, uh, working through matrix, matrices. Um, and increasingly, you didn't have one boss. You had two or three bosses. And your peers were as important as your subordinates and sometimes as important or more important than the boss. So all these individuals now got a say into whether you were an effective leader. And potentially, they now became involved in your development. With the rise of coaches, both internal and external coaches, in some way it took a bit of the uh, demand of coaching off of the boss. Um, in some ways it said that we need professionals who can coach. Uh, your job as a manager is not necessarily to be a, a coach. And um, I've often asked executive audiences um, how many of them have received training in how to be an effective coach. And I'll get, on average, about 15 to 20 percent of the hands up saying that they have been trained, which means that somebody, somewhere, you know, 80, 75, 80 percent of the managers that I've been exposed to and executives have not actually received formal training in how to be an effective coach. So they're learning on the job, um, but also because of the rise of the matrix, because of the complexity of teams today and work, uh, many of them find they don't have enough time to coach in addition. Uh, the final issue there is just the popularity of self-directed teams where the boss as someone you report into rather than the boss taking a very active role in the team's development and in the leadership aspects of the individual team members. So all of this has, in a way, lightened the development load of the boss or lightened the expectations of the boss being a primary lever in helping develop the talent that works for them. The paradox of this is that there was a very, uh, there's a really interesting study that was done in 2011 at Stanford. And I've got a quote here which, which summarizes the findings. Boss effects are large and significant. The main impact is teaching, not supervising or motivating. Two-thirds of the productivity boost persists even after the subordinate moves on to another boss. In contrast, peer effects appear to be trivial. So what this study showed was that, indeed, in a, in a very powerful way, the boss is, in many ways, your best source of development. Um, and you'll notice that they commented the main impact was through teaching. There have been a set of other studies uh, done at other business schools, and I've kind of summarized them very simply here, but um, swapping a poor manager with a good manager increases productivity. It's estimated in the range of roughly 12% for very straightforward clerical roles and something like up to 29 or 30% in roles requiring more latitude and thought. So this would be managing a manager or managing a professional. <clears throat> so in many ways, what we've done is actually I think we've taken some of the onus off of managers to be 
very, very pivotal players in leadership development. Um, so my solutions are, one, to remind ourselves, all of us in the field, that the boss is still a, if not in some ways, the most critical leverage point for development. And um, I cringe when I am asked to present at companies where we cascade upwards. In other words, we begin a program at the mid-level and then maybe, maybe move upwards. Uh, because in, in the ideal world, you would start with the top and cascade down because you're creating an, an appreciation for what the individuals who work for you are learning. <clears throat> that allows you then to reinforce those learnings. I think another best practice is something that I see in a hit or miss way with clients, which is involving the boss in the subordinates learning experience as a leader and using much more clever ways to do that and using multiple opportunities to do that the more common practice I see is uh, coming back from a leadership development program and having an hour with the boss to share your learnings. While that's an admirable outcome, it is wholly insufficient and really does not leverage the boss's ability to be an effective teacher. Um, that said, there are mentoring programs that have been set up and we know from a large body of research that those programs are hit or miss, depending in large part upon chemistry issues as well as life stage issues. And um, there are only a few organizations I've ever worked with that have taken mentoring programs and really thought through in quite sophisticated ways how to do better matching as well as how to actually train the boss in the pitfalls of mentoring and in the techniques for being an effective mentor. The final dimension, and I'll talk more about this when we get to make-believe metrics, is figuring out more clever ways to hold the boss accountable for the development of their staff. Um, tracking over time how many subordinates under this individual actually go on to significant leadership roles. Uh, it's a complex tracking demand, not easy to pull off, uh, but it would certainly be one which would potentially give you some insights into whether a boss was effective at developing people. Uh, similarly, you could use simpler, more uh, kind of now-based approaches using 360 assessments and, and focusing a section of the 360 on the ability of the boss to be an effective coach and mentor for the individual uh, and also measuring their effectiveness at using certain kinds of coaching approaches that we know generally speaking, are universally effective. I'm going to walk over now to the provider paradox. Um, and this one is based, again, back to the idea that we're in a large industry. You have multiple players. It's a very fragmented industry, uh, so you have a lot of diversity. It's a bit like the insurance industry. Um, and I've highlighted four particularly prominent providers. I couldn't put the hundreds, if not thousands, uh, up. Uh, and I've chosen four that I think represent to some degree the spectrum from uh, very high-end, intense residential executive education all the way down to web-based, short-term video learning. Um, <clears throat> and that gives you an idea of the, the breadth and the pedagogies they each bring, generally speaking, are unique to the provider. So you have a classic um, executive classroom, professors at the front, lots of PowerPoint slides, audiences taking notes. Off to the right, you have someone who's doing web-based learning by themselves, might be in 15-minute increments, might have a little quiz at the end, uh, might have them move on to the next level, might be available on call, so if they have a problem with managing conflict, uh, they can address that uh, in the moment, to um, small group facilitated learning, uh, which might be action learning, might be reflective learning, might be application of 360s. What happens is that these individuals become very deep experts 
in a subject and more importantly in a pedagogy. So if you were to hire a professor, generally speaking, their pedagogy is lectures, discussions. You're hired Center for Creative Leadership. Uh, one of their dominant pedagogies is self-assessments, 360 feedback, observational feedback. So you get deep expertise in how to do that pedagogy, and you get deep expertise in the particular subject you want to learn. That will then appear as a set of trade-offs, because the pedagogy in itself may need to be complemented by many others. So while reflective learning is a powerful way to learn about leadership, there are a lot of other approaches more related to skill building, kind of hands-on experiential learning, that are as important as reflective learning. And while programs attempt to do a more broad-based approach, if you look very closely at their experts, people who are in the, in the uh, classroom or in the learning exper experience, they tend to come out of a, a specialized background. And whether that's uh, a training background or whether that's a PhD in organizational behavior or whether that is a PhD in clinical psychology, that expertise, that history will reflect itself in a pedagogy, which I will argue is often narrow. Again, it brings you an advantage because they know that pedagogy well, but it allows for a trade-off in other learning experiences. Consulting firms, who I would argue probably dominate the field just in terms of sheer volume, um, have very strong needs to scale. Um, you're probably all familiar with the idea of utilization rates. Uh, and so they have to scale their product, and generally speaking, they prefer to do that across industries, uh, which is the idea of a portfolio. You know, if one industry goes down, finance, then they still have other industries from which they are reaping rewards. So they have a need to build universal products, which then create a set of trade-offs around the ability to customize. Business schools, which historically have been the primary provider and are no longer the primary provider, um, if you look at the composition of business school professors over the last two decades, there's been a very strong shift away from incentives to be a strong teacher, a very strong incentives to be um, less around customization for clients. And so there's a tendency for many of them to, to leverage a book that they've written or an article that has received enormous attention. In other words, they fall back on the product, their own product. And again, um, <clears throat> the assumption is that that product has universal appeal and universal application, and it may not. Uh, in-house training, in-house leadership development, well, the beauty of that, of course, is the individuals internally know the organization well. Uh, they often have inside information into the managers and executives who are sitting in the, the actual learning experience. Um, but the dilemma there is reinforcing internal worldviews. Um, an industry may need to be in the midst of a major change, but the executives who are teaching or the leadership development folks who are teaching may simply be actually reinforcing worldviews that need to be challenged. Um, there are also credibility issues, of course, as you move higher in terms of the hierarchy and you move to an executive population, um, their needs for a sense of, I would argue, status and prestige uh, make internal L leadership development less attractive. Um, they often are a tough audience, and so you have dilemmas with credibility. So what I'm really saying here is that we're in a world in which the providers bring unique advantages, but as a result, there are important trade-offs that are made. Probably number one is the pedagogies are narrow. And yet we know that adults need multiple forms of pedagogies in order to learn something. Because of the provider emphasis on products, they tend to be one-time experiences. They tend to be packaged into half days, one days, two days, three days, um, and then the experience is over. There might be a one-day follow-up or a two-day follow-up, but as we all know, leadership development is more than a one-time experience. And so you get a 
very important trade-off in terms of stickiness of learning. My other concern is that probably half of the leadership competencies in your organization are universals. In other words, I could go to another organization in your field, but in an, as well as one in another industry, and the same leadership issues would be prevalent. But the other half are unique, and they're unique because of your culture, and they're unique because of the strategic demands of your organization. Most providers are not able to customize in, I would argue, a meaningful way to meet the cultural and strategic needs uh, of leadership development for your organization. There are a handful of organizations, a handful of business schools, who actually are good at customization, but they're few and far between. And uh, they tend to be more expensive because they actually are having to go through a degree of customization. Um, I wanted to highlight just the universals because I think these universals tend to be pretty universal, certainly from my experience in the field for about 30 years. These were identified by the Corporate Leadership Council as top bench, in other words, senior level leader weaknesses, uh, consistently across a large sample of companies they interviewed. And as you look at that list, you can probably say to yourself, well, yes, I, I see those as gaps in my executives as well. I could see, uh, see how those might be universal. And what I'm highlighting here is that these, many of these are enduring. In other words, um, this is why the productization and the provider dilemma is a serious one, because these constantly need attention, no matter what year, no matter what decade. Um, and yet they may or may not receive attention because of the productization and the provider paradox. So one provider might focus on an inspirational leadership program, but that might be the only one you're using that year. And yet in reality, what you actually might need is someone who can come in and also speak on the global issues for your leaders. So I think that the trade-off of having universal offerings, which is, again, what pr most providers are seeking to do, um, because of the ability to leverage across companies and organizations and leverage across industries has created a very important customization gap which has to be filled by you or by you and I finding providers who will offer a high degree of customization. And I just highlight four areas that demand customization and that is what are the cultural attributes of your organization that the exemplar leaders model. There's also a shadow to almost all of those. So one organization that I've worked for, extremely relationship oriented, very wonderful and warm, the shadow is accountability. Uh, people don't hold each other accountable. And so leadership attributes need to address both what the exemplars should be modeling, but also how the exemplars can address the shadow side to the advantage of the culture. Uh, all of your organizations probably have an emerging strategic need that has to be addressed. And leadership development is one of the most powerful ways to do that, engaging your leaders in how to address that new strategic need. Um, you have derailers, some of which are universal, as we saw with the Corporate Leadership Council, but you also have unique derailers, which are the product of your cultural attributes and potentially might have implications related to the strategic needs that are emerging. Um, those are unique to your organization. They need to be identified, they need to be called out, and people need to develop themselves around how to avoid these or how to preempt these derailers. And then there are transition demands that are unique to your world, um, which have to do with leadership. And those need to be called out, and those ultimately, I would argue, need to be uh, embedded in developmental experiences as well. So these are four areas that you need to think about customization that would push you beyond the product. Um, there might be a few products that address some of these, um, but there are not many. So I believe that what you have to start doing, and I see this in some organization, is create a central corporate hub uh, for coordination of what the offerings are. And this core hub also is the owner of a core leadership competency framework 
this is usually one that's a universal framework that applies across most of the organization and it meets the cultural needs and the strategic needs of the organization. On the other hand, uh, you want a degree of tailoring given unique demands that might come up and there might be unique leadership issues in one of your local operating units. Uh, your operating units in China may have very different leadership demands that are unique to a growing business or an entrepreneurial business opportunities that at your corporate center, which is a more mature uh, operation, uh, leadership demands are going to be quite different. So you want to have the ability to do both the universals and the unique, but you need a central hub that kind of coordinates that. Um, and then I think you need to be very, very thoughtful about how do these different providers complement one another. We tend to think about that along the dimensions of content, but I really believe we have to think about that more around the complementary pedagogies. And um, so one of the things which I always say is, what are the backgrounds? Where has this person come from? Where has their training been? And that will tell you a great deal about the pedagogy they bring into the learning experience. Again, my argument there is you want a variety of pedagogies um, in order to ensure the development impact. Our next fault line is ownership. And again, I mentioned earlier the fact that when you get a lot of products out there, and some of the products are not as expensive as they might be, um, people throughout the organization can buy what they like. <laughs> And um, I'm going to show you the ownership of leader development in, in one client company that I've worked with. Uh, and uh, there is a CEO executive leadership program that's run by the CEO. It has its own competency model. Uh, it has its own learning experiences that are unique. Uh, they also have a high potentials leadership program. And that has a different competency model. And uh, that has a different training experience. And it has different faculty and different trainers. Uh, it also, this organization has a country manager's leadership program. Uh, and those actually vary to some degree depending on the country. And those all have their own somewhat unique leadership development uh, models. Uh, then there is uh, United States, which is where the company is based, a functional, there are functional IT leadership programs, HR leadership programs. Again, all unique. And if you were to look inside this company, you would say uh, the jigsaw puzzle is scattered everywhere. Uh, I see little pieces of something that must be part of some coherent whole, but it's clear that I can't piece it together and probably no one else can. Um, I think that is probably more symptomatic of the state of leadership development in organizations today than we would like to admit. I think there are some very important dilemmas with that, and that is who ends up owning leadership development. Um, is it the CEO? Probably not. Uh, is it the chief learning officer? Um, probably for many of the core programs. Uh, or is it the chief human resources officer? Uh, is there a leadership development function, and who does that report into, and what do they own, and what's their say? Uh, is the talent management group tied in or not? Uh, what kind of input and ownership do line managers have? So what we see is that ownership in general uh, is splintered in large part because some of these players are seen not to possess enough depth. Uh, some of these players may not have a real interest in leadership development. They may have other priorities. So I think the solution from my standpoint is that we have to do two things, and they're a bit of a paradox. One is create the mentality that individuals really own their leadership development. Um, that this is something, when you join our organization, you're responsible for your development. But it has to be proven to them that there's a payoff. And so there have to be transparent ties to rewards and opportunities, those who actually show strong development in the right areas and not leading to strong performance actually get recognized and get promoted and get great opportunities. Um, I believe that leadership development, as I mentioned earlier, needs to be institutionalized, but primarily through a central hub. And that hub should also interconnect leadership development with talent management. I see the two of them as highly intertwined. And the organizations that I feel often do the best job of leadership development have them as highly intertwined activities versus ones which segregate them into two separate silos. 
Um, I believe that accountability needs to be more tightly interconnected between the CEO, the top team, senior line managers, HR, and high potentials. That often, too often, it ends up having a narrow home, i.e., maybe one, um, the CHRO is a very keen fan of leadership development, and then she becomes the owner. Um, we pay a high price for that because when that individual is promoted or moves on, um, the interest wanes. The final one is what I call make believe metrics. And uh, here's the standard fare. Uh, when I, as an executive educator, walk in and the end of my session, I'll always be rated on the quality of instruction, which is useful. I'm not, not going to knock that. You do want good instructors. But it actually doesn't tell you much in terms of the long term impact. It's a very good metric in the short term, but it doesn't tell you much in terms of whether this actually stuck and was applied and actually translated into more effectiveness for the individual. The second one, which is also commonplace, which is how is the learning experience and was it useful? Could, could you actually take some of the tools and, and lessons back? Again, uh, it's in the moment. It's right after the experience. Um, and it gives you a perspective about the applicability, so it's useful. But again, it doesn't tell us anything about whether the person actually did apply it. Some of the others are common metrics that I've seen in my career, which from my standpoint um, are all misleading. They don't tell you much about anything uh, other than utilization rates or dollars spent per employee. Um, we don't know about the quality of the instruction. We don't know about the quality of learning experience. We don't know about whether it had any long-term impact. So to be a bit provocative, I think leadership development should actually rethink its metrics and think around the impact for the longer range or longer term. Uh, are we better able to fill leadership jobs? Do we have bigger pipelines now of talent than we have had in the past? Um, are, if we look historically, are fewer individuals derailing in their promotions, in their transitions to more complex leadership jobs? Um, to what extent are leadership programs building champions and people who are deeply committed to achieving our strategic goals? Um, to what extent are individuals demonstrating the behaviors that they learned in the experience one year later? Do we actually follow up with many 360s? So you might, in a program, an individual might be exposed to five leadership dimensions. They might choose one to work on for a year. Do they receive a abbreviated 360 a year later, which shows whether they've made progress or not made progress along that one area that they've chosen for their development? What is their feedback from their boss around that area a year later? What is the feedback from peers and subordinates? Um, in other words, we're not leveraging longer time frame track records. Um, and I think we should be much more clever about that, particularly given the fact that we now have the ability to, to literally use very simple ways of following up. Um, I think there has to be some very thoughtful preparation to help people in the process of identifying goals for development beyond just a development plan but then a lot of thought in terms of how do we measure whether they succeeded at this one year later. Uh, that said, I think in many ways that's what we're all about, which is actually helping individuals develop new capacities or significantly improve upon existing leadership capacities. And what I fear is that we don't track those well. So as I wrap up, these are some concluding thoughts that I would really encourage you and your organization to think more carefully about, and that is investing more in processes, and I would argue investing more in institutionalization of leadership development than products. Products can play a role, but the handful of companies and not-for-profits that I have admired for leadership development have all institutionalized leadership development. 
And so no matter who the CEO is, no matter who the HR officer is, no matter who the leadership development people are, um, those processes endure. Uh, they are not flavor of the month. So it's very important to think more deeply about kind of what are what are the ways to institutionalize leadership development processes that will, will have legs for the long run. Um, secondly, quest, customize your core models. Um, many of you are probably doing this, but I really believe that this is key because it helps you see which of the products might fit best given your unique demands for leadership. And potentially it serves as a template for not getting too caught up in what is a hot leadership topic. Third design for very high customization is the top, and I think probably many of you are doing this, but then figure out clever ways for mass customization at the middle and the entry levels. And one of the nice things about the web-based learning of today is we have far more opportunities for mass customization than we have ever had. And of course, you want to look for providers who can do that for you. You can provide that mass customization in a, in a, in a, in a true customization way. Um, I've always said, don't be dependent on one or two providers. Uh, deploy multiple providers. Uh, really think carefully about how each of these brings a unique vantage point, a unique pedagogy, uh, and you want to blend them and leverage their differences. Uh, move back to the boss. Uh, really think carefully about how you can leverage your bosses much more effectively. Uh, but I, I just see this over and over again. Bosses need actually more training and development, and particularly around skills like coaching. And then centralized coordination of leadership development towards the top. Make sure that the CEO is a champion and sponsor, but then make sure that everybody is engaged at, at multiple levels beyond the specific owners of leadership development. Well, I hope that's given you a, uh, some insights into kind of where I see the world today in leadership development. It's a remarkable field, and uh, I think in many ways my concern is that while there are areas of leadership development that are evolving and are actually quite exciting right now, um, there are aspects of the field that have matured and standardized and really have become captive to what I would call industry dynamics, which are not serving any of us that well. And so my challenge to myself and to you is thinking very carefully about these fault lines and figuring out clever ways that you can mitigate them in your own initiatives, in your own organizations. So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been provocative. And I wish you the best in your leadership development. Thanks, Jay. If anyone has any questions, we have a couple of minutes if you want to type them in the chat box or raise your hand. Um, but also, if you want to get a little deeper into this topic with Jay, we're having a master class in, on March 10th and 11th in Foster City, hosted by um, Gilead, um, and that's in the Bay Area in California. And you can reach out to me or anybody at our center if you have any questions about that. So I'm just going to hang out for a second and just see if any questions pop up or any hands pop up. And Carrie, I would say the um, seminar that I'm offering, the master class, um, tries to avoid a number of these fault lines, but more importantly, it's not so much looking at how you can build better leadership development for your organizations, but it's really how you can be um, a m even more masterful and influential individual in driving your agendas, hopefully w w some of the work we're doing here. So one question I had is, um, what good examples have I seen of organizations holding uh, bosses accountable for doing this well? Uh, I'll be very candid with you, and I work across a lot of different businesses. I've actually never seen one that does a good job. I've seen ones that have uh, some good interventions, but they're done inconsistently. And so the idea of holding bosses accountable uh, falls through the cracks. Uh, and I can think of one organization where they do track how many individuals has this indiv has this boss mentored who have gone on to more senior ranks in the organization. 
and that's the only one I can think of that actually does it does measure over time. And they measure it around this kind of singular point of view. Another question I had is, uh, I'm curious how you incorporate better ways to connect with generations and international leaders in the workplace. Um, those are two big topics, and I've written quite extensively in many of these papers, I think, are available through the center on global or international leadership. Um, and so, Don, I'd encourage you to get from the center some of the work I've done there, because I think that would answer your question about the international leaders. The generations, um, I think we really do need to be focused now on the millennials, because I think many of them are stepping into their first or second leadership role. And I'm a great fan of interconnecting millennials with Gen X, who are, you know, their bosses, uh, and creating cross-generational leadership development programs. I, I haven't seen many, but I think it's a it's a terrific opportunity. Uh, what's the difference between high customization and mass customization? So high customization uh, would be an executive program where literally the provider comes in, they assess uh, to a great degree what are common derailers among the executive team, uh, what are the strategic demands of the organization at this moment in time, and what do leaders need to do far more effectively to drive those demands. The content of the program will be completely customized. You'll have um, a variety of learning experiences, You'll have a variety of internal and external faculty. Uh, you might have case studies that are built around actual company issues. Mass customization, the classic of this would be you have a provider who offers uh, either web-based learning or in you know, kind of learning experiences where you have a um, cafeteria style. You have 30 different topics to choose from. And uh, one might be um, setting goals, one might be uh, providing vision, one might be <laughs> addressing conflict, one might be you know, how you could become more inspirational. And mass customization, either the individual gets to choose of the 30, the 10 that they most need or want, uh, or you choose the 10 that fit most well with a first-time leader. Uh, but you are restricted to this portfolio of offerings. <clears throat> Um, one of you very nicely suggests, and I love it, is uh, one way I connect with millennials is reverse mentoring. That's, it's a really wonderful idea, and um, many of you are familiar with Jack Welch, the famous CEO from, from General Electric of, a decade ago, and one of my favorite things that he did is he went and got himself uh, a, a mentor in his uh, mid-20s who came and taught him all about the Internet. And it's this idea of reverse mentoring. And that is a very powerful one. And we don't leverage that much at all because we tend to think of mentoring as downwards versus reversing it. Carrie, I think we're unfortunately at the end. Okay, yeah, thanks, Jay, for a great, a great webinar. If anybody else has any questions, you can shoot me an email um, or just shoot an email to CEO um, at usc.edu. If you have any questions about Jay's program in March, just shoot us an email there. I'm happy to respond to that. You'll receive this webinar um, probably Monday afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and thank you, Jay, for another great webinar. You're thank you, Jay. Welcome. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good day.